Hey, everybody, this is Laura Whitmore with the Women's International Music Network, and I'm very stoked to have an awesome panel of women in the music industry today for our She Rocks a panel, talking about their careers, some advice, cool happenings, how they got where they are, their challenges, all the fun stuff. Um, so I thought I'd start out, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. As I said, I'm founder of the Women's International Music Network. I've been in the musical instruments industry for over 30 years. Currently Senior Vice President of Marketing for Positive Grid, a company that specializes in musical instruments and software. And I'm a singer-songwriter too. So I'm going to ask the panel to just maybe introduce themselves, say a little bit about your role, and then we'll just kind of dig in to, to some questions I have for you. So let's start with Stacy. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stacy Ryan. I am the Chief Operating Officer at School of Rock. Um, so I am on the business side of the music industry. I'm not a musician, uh, but we have just over 60,000 students worldwide um, that we are very passionate in creating strong music experience and uh, teaching them how to play great music by putting them in bands and on stages. So really excited to be here with everybody. Stacy, what, tell us a little bit about what your role entails for School of Rock. Sure. So I have a team um, that is incredible and together we oversee all of the operations, the safety um, in all of our 300, almost 40 locations across the world. So we're currently in 15 countries, um, as I said, with 60,000 students. So my team oversees the performance of all the schools. Uh, we directly oversee, we own and operate 46 locations ourselves. Um, and together we just help drive the success of the schools, the experience of the students, and ensuring that it's always done in a safe, inclusive environment. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, uh, Lindsay, how about you introduce yourself, talk sure. a little bit about your role. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay Love, and I'm the artist and community relations manager at Taylor Guitars. Um, a little bit about my role. I it's kind of exactly what it sounds like. I get to, uh, on the one side of things, work with artists that, uh, all the different artists that play Taylor guitars at all different levels of their career from, we really do try to support artists at every phase of their career, whether they're gigging musicians, weekend warriors, or they're the emerging about to break, or they're more of the household names. Um, so we just, a part of me, is, what I do is just supporting them with guitars or or discounts or just how we can support them on tours or maybe finding ways to collaborate and do content together. Um, and then on the other side of things, on the community relations side of things, I, I intentionally look out for nonprofits or schools that are um, that have like-minded vision, whether it's music um, education, access to music education or sustainability and find ways to collaborate and partner with community organizations. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Beth. Hey, everybody. Um, first of all, thanks for having me here. It's great. And boy, my liking hearing about the two of you, you guys are amazing. So it's already like fantastic to be here. Um, but it, yes, who am I? I'm a vice president at Musicians Institute. I've um, been in that position since I think 2008. And I've worn a lot of hats there. I was uh, previously department chair of GIT, the Guitar Institute of Technology. Um, I've been on the guitar faculty for 36 years. And um, in my free time, I'm also a executive director of a nonprofit uh, scholarship granting organization. We give money away to students uh, to go to music college. Um, I've been very involved in a lot of nonprofits and giving back to the community over many, many years. Uh, so that's a very important part of life for me. And the other really big thing I'd say what's central to me is um, that I am a musician. I'm a jazz guitar player. And maybe I should have started with that in order of priority. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. one for me. But um, anyway, it's really great to be here. So, so thanks again for asking. Me. Yes, a kick ass guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> I think I wrote about you in guitar world before I ever met you. So I love that. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Great, really. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's been central. I'm sure we'll talk about this, but, you know, just being able to um, talk 
about that that history, that story, the stories of female guitar players, and and we all have this through line, all all four of us, you know, about that one thing. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm I'm uh, really uh, I feel fortunate that every day I get to play the guitar. It's a good day every day I get to play. Yeah, so, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, I wanted to start off on a positive note and ask you guys, um, you know, what excites you most about what you do and maybe also has there been anything that maybe has surprised you about your role so does anybody want to start uh from that perspective okay stacy i can start um i think my answers will be a little bit different but i'll start with what surprised me so i've spent my entire career in education so i spent first decade of my career doing supplemental tutoring then i went into educational preschool and I actually went into School of Rock um, with no intention of staying. I went in as a consultant. It was going to be just a temporary pit stop for me. And then some life things had happened. I decided to join full time. And I remember I had to convince myself that I was making an impact on children's lives. And, you know, I remember talking to myself and saying, okay, like, it's still education. It's music education, but it's still education. You're still enriching lives. And then I actually saw our mission in action. And, you know, I very quickly realized that I was having the most impact I've ever had in my entire career or life in children here at School of Rock. And, you know, it was an incredible surprise um, and just one that I, I didn't expect and, you know, what I love most about what we do is we, and I, I know this is a very bold statement to say, but I truly believe we save lives. Um, and, you know, we, we are the home for kids who have no home. Um, we are the safe space that we don't, we don't care about your pronoun. We don't care about the color of your hair, or the clothes that you wear, or the music that you listen to. All we care about is like, let's get together and jam and make great music together and put on, you know, a kick-ass show together. And that's our priority. And, you know, the Society Prevention for Teen Suicide is a partner of ours. We work closely with them. And I have seen firsthand, have heard from students, from parents, from staff, from so many different community members through the almost nine years now that I've been with School of Rock that it, it has saved these kids' lives, that they had no friends and now they had friends, that they didn't think that they belonged anywhere and now they've found their tribe with us and they've found their purpose. So, you know, every time I get to see our kids perform and I get to see them you know, play on stage at Lollapalooza or at Bonnaroo, which I'm heading to this weekend to watch them perform at, or get on a tour bus for 10 days because they've become mm -hmm. a School of Rock all-star and live out these incredible dreams and do things that make them way cooler than I ever was. Um, <laughs> it's just seeing how it changes their lives, the their encounters with artists that they admire so much that we're able to help coordinate the instruments that we're able to put in their hands that they never thought they'd be able to have. So just seeing it all through their eyes is my favorite thing to do. And, you know, at School of Rock, we always say if we're ever feeling frustrated or losing connection, you know, sitting at our desks in our office, pushing through, like, go see a show, go to a school and sit in a lesson, like, go watch the kids. And like that, you're just recharged. And we're like, all right, we're ready to go. We could tackle the world. We can do this. So yeah, that's my favorite. That's amazing. <laughs> I got very emotional listening to that story. So. <laughs> I think yeah. it's, it's, it's really wonderful. And it's so resonant, you know, to my experience to being in education for, for so many years, because you know, really, we work for those students. We work for them. They're our boss. It's not the bottom line. It's not the budget. It's not the all the other peripheral things. It's really very, very direct and and uh, so rewarding year after year. And you know, uh, to to kind of echo your experience, Stacy. My biggest surprise, since that was Laura's question about what surprised me, is mm. um, similar to you. I I. Um, around 1987, I think it was, I was offered a job to teach at Musicians Institute and I was super honored. Um, that was amazing. And I, I kind of had the sense that 
it's probably temporary, you know, maybe I'll do it for a year, you know, that that's probably what it's going to be, but you know, wow, I can't believe that I have to do this job. And I, I think I'm going to be a session musician and tour and I, I'm not going to be a teacher. That's, that's not, you know, my purpose. Um, well, the biggest surprise, of course, it is my purpose. It's very much been the most uh, extraordinary gift to be able to teach thousands and thousands of students all these years later and all those lives, you know, to be a part of, the DNA of, of their dreams of helping kind of an extension of what you're talking about with the kids, um, you know, to really help them achieve whatever it is that they dream um, has been the greatest, you know, thing I'm most proud of in my life more than, you know, anything else. What a privilege to be able to be in that position. And that was the surprise. Um, that <laughs> I thought, oh yeah, a year, that sounds good. <laughs> Boy, am I glad I, I'm glad that I stayed and, you know, we may talk about persevering and, you know, what you have to break through and what you have to go through and, and the kind of tenacity to succeed in those sorts of situations. But the payoff is so deep and so uh, profound, just like you're saying, Stacey. So it's really wonderful to hear you echoing the same experience yeah. too. It's really, really uh, a privilege. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I, I always think like when you're going through a rough time or you're not as motivated to like get outside yourself and like, Will help somebody else shifts your whole perspective. You know, mm. it's very powerful. Yeah. Lindsay, uh, share about your your role. What excites you, and what surprised you? Yeah, I have surprised me. I, I I don't know. I think I think I would say the what's exciting me. Maybe answer, it might be the same thing as surprising me. But over the last few years since I've been on the team, we have been really intentional about expanding our reach um, within different genres, different players, um, you know, the ever increasing diversity of the music world, it's never changed, it's never gonna stop. And so just being more intentional about extending olive branches to genres and people that maybe um, we didn't have access to, especially as our team has grown. Um, I, I think one thing we've stressed is like, if we wanna be a, if we wanna have global artist reach, um, we have to be intentional about building a global diverse program. And so that's been really exciting. We're, we, in the last three years, we've been heavily involved in um, like the, the uh, Latin alternative music conference, different, like the, the Latin Grammys that we, we're getting heavily involved in the music scene and in, in Asia and in Africa. And so we're just, that's really exciting for me just to see. Um, and then just even here in America, just extending our reach with different players and, and different genres. I think sometimes acoustic guitar um, has a perception of, uh, of being like a folk, like old white guy kind of instrument. <laughs> and that, and you know, and I started playing guitar when I was 11 and I was playing classical and then I ended up getting more into like jazz and then soul and then I gospel and all sorts of different stuff. I've been playing guitar forever. And so I knew we belonged in, these spaces of soul and R&B and hip hop. But um, I think uh, from a marketing perspective, acoustic guitar isn't always associated with those other genres. So what's been really exciting for me is, is just seeing, um, yeah, us get involved, get in those spaces, become kind of well-known in those spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the evolution of what's happening in the industry, who's playing yeah. instruments, um, who's, collaborating you know even I love I, I even love when I see some somebody who obviously learned you know how to play trombone in school and then they take it into their rock band or whatever it's like the coolest thing to happen so that's cool um okay I'm gonna flip it now and just ask you guys about challenges like what challenges have you faced maybe in your career getting to this role or or in this role as well what what is what challenges you so who wants to start with that? Anybody? If not, I'm going to call on somebody. <laughs> okay, Beth, why don't we start with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I would, I would say it's true. It's a recipe that's true with every career. You know, if you want to talk about challenge, you have to be willing to fail, period. Mm. Okay. So um, I, I, I wouldn't say that I have... Um, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, challenges are, are really, I think, one of being um, 
holding true to the values that uh, define who you are, no matter what circumstance you're in professionally, whether you're on stage as a player or uh, running a program or working in the community or whatever, and that, that those core values, um, that they're not, that, that nobody can really, how can I say it? Uh, take them down. <laughs> No, that, that for me, it's been over years and years having the confidence to pursue what my goals are, being willing to change my goals if I need to, um, to allow myself, like I said, to fail, to be able to constantly learn. Those are sort of the hallmarks of being a good teacher, is that you're honest, you're kind, that you're um, accessible, you know, that all those things of who you are as a person don't get lost in the pursuit of a profession. So if we're talking about a challenge, to me, that's a very internal sort of answer, but that's yeah. really, you know, I think really, really important. Um, and it kind of answers how to deal with other challenges, whether it's, um, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, business issues or what have you. I think if you have that core, then, you know, I, I feel like I stay on a very steady, Footing through through all the all the different things that I've done of people underestimating me or uh, you know misogyny or any of these things that we encounter uh, in the music industry and elsewhere um, that that um, I look at challenges as opportunities really mm -hmm. to me I don't shy away from challenges at all in fact I run towards them to me it's mm -hmm. always a chance to, to go further oh so you're crazy I, I am crazy <laughs> and I had a hard time answering this question because of it because because I, you know um I like them yeah. I really do I'm not looking for a smooth ride I'm I'm looking mm -hmm. for a journey I'm looking to grow I'm looking to do more I'm looking to say yes to things that I don't already know how to do um mm -hmm. that, that's the, that's my um uh, DNA and doing all the things I've done professionally is like absolutely I am going to be the first uh, woman vice president at Musicians Institute. I am going to be the only female guitar teacher on the staff for decades. I am going to be in situations where I'm the only woman a lot. I am going to learn how to play music that kicks my butt. I am going to do it because not for someone else, but it's for me, you know? And so mm -hmm. that that's a very, very simple recipe. But yeah, I really don't want to stay the same. At the end of this whole, you know, adventure, I don't want to be the same person that I was when I started teaching at GIT 36 years ago. And believe me, it was a challenge. I was terrified, you know, to teach in what I perceived as the world's most famous guitar school. I mean, I love Berkeley and, you know, I admire them. So I don't wanna, you know, platitudes, forget it. But at the time, that's the way I thought, you know, and I just graduated and I was in absolute terror. But I told them, the guys that were interviewing me, I said, you know, it's a sort of a Buddhist saying of turning poison into medicine. I'm going to turn poison into medicine. I'm going to take this situation and, you know, I didn't say like, just watch, you know, but it really, <laughs> you know, that's the, that was the attitude that's propelled me down this river of music, you know, writing the guitar is sort of the leaf, you know, but that's the thing. Like, yeah, I'm going to run towards it for sure. So you got me all excited. <laughs> what other challenge? Anyway, so, awesome. um, so that's my answer. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Stacy, what are your what are your thoughts? Um, I mean that so much of what you said resonated with me, especially you know, not losing who you are. Um, my biggest challenge was just being a woman, honestly, and navigating all that came with it. And you know, why you saying don't lose who you are? I, I came really close to that. And, you know, we, we've spoken about this. We spoke about it with Lindsay and with Laura and yeah. Nam. And, you know, I've, I've sat in a room with 14 people and the only other woman in the room is there to take notes. And I had to find my courage to take up my space and use my voice and remind myself that I'm there because I belong there. Mm -hmm. I had to, you know, mute those that were telling me to be successful, I had to pull my hair back. Now I do it because I like it um, and put lipstick on and, you know, only wear red nail polish and, you know, trying to find that balance of being assertive and establishing authority, but not being seen as a bitch and, you know, a horrible person. And it's, um, 
that was the the hardest part and i continue to to really work on that and i've been blessed with so many incredible mentors in my life i i launched you know a group frontwoman.org where you know women can just and men come together on a quarterly basis and we talk through some of these challenges and try and learn from each other and learn new things i learn every time we have a conversation around it um, around unconscious biases and you know, things that are happening in the workplace and how to find your voice. So, you know, for me, I'm, I'm really passionate about, about raising awareness um, of, you know, what happens with women, both in the music industry and in corporate America. You know, the fact that we have 26% of women are in C-level positions and the rest are men and only 5% of those women are women of color. It's not okay. You know, we've moved three percent in five years that's crazy it's going too slow so now when you dig into the music industry the numbers are are even worse so you know i feel that we've come so far but there's still so much further that we have to go and that that was my biggest struggle was finding finding my strength to climb my way and fight my way and prove my way up to that sea level position but also doing it in a way that I can look and be proud of the leader who I am and I'm teaching others along the way how to do it the right way and how to how to do it in a way that when you look in a mirror you're proud of who you see because early in my career a manager was trying to mold me in a way that I looked in the mirror and I'm like I don't I don't like this person and that's when I made a big career change because I knew it just it wasn't putting me down the right path. So, you know, staying true to yourself, being a person who you're proud of, I think is the most important thing because you're the one that has to look at yourself in the mirror. You're the one that has to sleep with yourself at night. Um, And, you know, keeping, keep fighting, you know, keep pushing, keep breaking barriers, keep taking up that space, using your voice. And remember that if you're in the room, you're, you're there because you belong there and remind yourself. And, you know, the last thing that you said, Beth, that I loved is you run towards challenges. And I just had this conversation with a younger female manager and I told her, anytime you're in a situation where you feel uncomfortable, remind yourself that you feel uncomfortable because it's new. It's a skill set you haven't yet developed. It's an experience yet that you haven't yet had. So when you feel uncomfortable, remind yourself that in that moment, you're growing professionally and personally. And that will help you shift from maybe fear and discomfort to more excitement and curiosity. So I too run for those moments, although they're uncomfortable and sometimes a little scary, I know that it's because it's new. I'm adding something new to my toolbox. I'm adding newer yeah. experiences, knowledge, and I'm going to be better in the end for it. So I always mm-hmm. try and just nurture that feeling and appreciate it more. Mm-hmm. Mm. I agree. I think, I think like challenge that question's hard for probably all of us on this call because I think we are all in male dominated spaces. And we've talked about, we've talked, we talked about this at the last panel, but uh, one of the challenges, kind of what you said, Beth, is the credibility thing, you know, like not you, you, we, we should, we shouldn't have to prove ourselves, but it does sometimes feel that way. But all four of us are still in the industry. So we have no issue with doing that. That's what I, I, you know, we kind of, let's do it. You want to chat like you, you know, do we have to prove ourselves? Absolutely. And we'll do it. But, um, but that is a challenge and I, and I can see why a lot of people are shy away from it. But I think a lot of what I'm going to say is the same thing they were saying. I, I think over the, over the years in like on my path to where I am now, it's always been this idea of telling myself that I belong in those rooms and that my voice is needed and my ideas and my, my, uh, my, my opinion is, is valued and it's important in those spaces because it's making that room have to think about things they would have never thought about. It's my unique perspective. Um, mm-hmm. The other, the other thing about that I think is, you know, because I'm, uh, I've, I've been in some sector of the music industry for a really long time, whether it was an independent artist or a creative director, or now this, I've had to, you know, I came in I think when I was 22 or 23, 
um, doing something. And I've always been around older, um, um, older white men, usually in the industry spaces that I've been in. And <laughs> I've had to tell myself, you know, that it's okay. And this is still a, a, a tricky one because I was young and I still am young, but it's okay to not know everything. And mm -hmm. because we shouldn't be expected to, we're not expected to, but I think sometimes when you're in these spaces and there are men or women that are older than you and you're in there the, and you want to, you want to throw an idea out there. You want to bring yourself to the room. You, there's a fear of like, if I sound stupid, they're never going to let anybody like me back in that room. Um, and I have, a, it's like a double thing for me because it's not just I'm a woman, I'm a young woman, but well, it's a triple thing because I'm also a black woman. So that weight of, of like, uh -oh, if I, I had to get over that and say, you know what, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's, and, and, and that's a, a work in progress, but it's still, it's, that's probably the biggest challenge is realizing, you know what, show up hundred percent authentically yourself and it's okay to not know everything and you belong in this room. So say, you know, contribute. Yeah, that's really great. Can I just add one thing? I'm sorry, I didn't butt in, but yeah. Stacey, well, both yeah. of you, Lindsay and Stacy, talked about, Stacy, you mentioned about mentors and, and, and you did too, actually, Lindsay. And I think it's really important as you're going through all these chapters, uh, you know, and, and progression in your life and your career that you have, uh, of course, great friends that you can talk to about this, peers that you can talk to about this, this you know, experience, a couple of mentors or three or four. If they're white, older white dudes or whoever they are, it doesn't really matter who they are if they're a mentor to you. Um, and, um, you know, and eventually build a community, you know, of like-minded people that support you and resonate with you because it's really important because I think if you're just going to go through in a silo, you're not going to last. And I, I suspect that all of us on this, this call have done that many times over and it's a really essential ingredient yeah. because of the challenges you know whether you know it's particular to being a woman in this in industry or whatever you know you have to have somebody to talk to or it's just about you know getting a tailor guitar you know in you know th to thailand tomorrow or whatever it is but it's just like you know we have to have our trusted our trusted advisors our friends and people to, i mean i have great friends i can confide in and tell the truth to and that's super necessary. So I didn't mean to interrupt someone, but it, it just, you know, I heard both of you kind of allude to that. And that's a really huge thing. Absolutely. Because I know she's she's got a great, you know, group of people who support her too. And we're some mm -hmm. of them. So we're included. Well, I have like so many things to unpack in that conversation. <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind was I, I'm going to tell a quick story. Like I was uh, in the group chief for a year. I don't know if you guys know that it's a mentorship group for executive level women, not just in the music industry. And one of the exercises they had us do was like map our life, not just our career, but like the ups and downs of our life. So you like see every like up and down and like really think about what, what happened after you had the really down times. And it made it very clear that the challenges and the really hard times led to the most amazing times later. Like if you don't go through those challenges, you don't get to the big moments, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that fear of failure sometimes keeps us from um, going through those terrible times. But those are the things that propel you into like this level that you never thought you could be at. So I don't know if you guys have experienced that, but it was like a, a light bulb moment for me. Mm -hmm. you know? oh, absolutely. It's right on the money, right on the money. Yeah. You got to be able to fail to get it. Yeah. Now. Get uh, yeah, and the other thing um, mm -hmm. that I just lost my train of thought for, but oh, I know. Um, I was going to say it was I I did a podcast recently, and somebody asked me like, "What is uh, the challenge of being a leader?" Actually, it might have Stacy. It might have been a question from the newsletter that you did. Um, but one of the things that I always think about when people ask me about being a leader is like you realize that nobody knows everything. Like you don't, people, you think all oh, these people, they're so experienced, they know everything. Like they don't know. They're, as a leader, you are constantly doing things you have never done before. <laughs> but the thing that you do know is you're gonna be able to figure it out. Like, you know, yeah. oh, I'll call this person. Or if I don't know, I'll ask that person. Or I'll, I'll, you can say in a meeting, like, you know, I don't know, let me, let me think about that. Or maybe we can ask this guy or, you know, bring in a consultant or whatever it is. And I think, 
knowing that it's okay to not know everything and that the real key trait is that you know how to figure it out. Yeah. That is the thing that people want to see. Mm -hmm. That you are somebody who can figure it out. So mm -hmm. there you mm -hmm. go. <laughs> That's my two cents in that, in that conversation. Um, I... Uh, I would pivot a little bit to talking about your careers again. I'm like, if somebody wanted to follow in your path, like what kind of characteristics or trading or personality even, like what makes somebody successful in what you do? <laughs> um, I think, I think, any woman going into corporate America, going into music industry, you have to know what you're going into. You have to you have to have a little bit of a tougher skin. Mm -hmm. um, you and it's it's not fair. All these things are completely unfair. So I, I know that as I say it, but it's it's reality. So you have to have tougher skin. You you have to be more willing to take those risks because um, unfortunately, as women, you do have to prove yourself a little bit more um, than others in the room may need to. And don't be afraid to take those risks to speak up and to put yourself out there. Um, you know, I, I'm head of operations, so... Anyone interested in operations, what I love about operations and some people struggle, I, I always compare it to like a, a coat rack. And in one moment we may have a marketing hat on and the next moment we have to take that off and we have to put our HR hat on and the next moment we have to take that off and put on our education hat and then take that off and operations encompasses everything. Um, you know, everything is within their safety everything that goes into operating a location, a unit, whatever it is, whatever industry that you're in. So, you know, detail orientation is important. Um, a proactive mentality, a get it done type of mentality. You know, if you're in operations and you're not strong at meeting deadlines, you're not going to be successful in that type of role because it, it is a lot of time sensitive items and it's also you know the the unknown you know we have emergencies don't run on schedules so you know when things happen they're often nights or weekends and you have to be flexible and in all situations ready to pivot um you know whether it's because an event and it's raining and you didn't have a rain plan or a shipment didn't show up on time or there's a global pandemic and your organization is focused on performance-based music education. Um, you have to, you have to be in a place where you can pivot. You can take that step back. You can assess. And like you said, Laura, find the solution to the problem, be solution based. Um, you know, don't walk in and present problems, walk in and present problems with solutions that, that mm -hmm. I think was, a really long way in establishing yourself within whatever career that you choose to take. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lindsay, what about you? How do you, how do you become an artist relations person at Taylor guitarist? <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of different routes to <laughs> an artist relations uh, manager at a, a music instrument manufacturing company. But I mean, I think, some qualities is that outside of like getting in, you know, if you're an artist yourself or working at, at a label or working at a DSP and finding your way, getting familiar with just the business of music. And I mean, really my job, it comes down to relationships. You have to be some, be, you have to be a kind of a person that somebody likes to be around, <laughs> you know, that, that, you know, you have to, you have to be authentically yourself, be comfortable in any space you go into. And, um, and, and know how to, yeah, I mean, know how to maintain relationships and just be um, a person of your word. Um, but I think outside of that, just kind of back, like doubling down on what Stacey said, I think when you're going into the music instrument or music business space, you, as a woman, you have to, unfairly or not, you know, you have to have um, 
a, a, almost an extra strong worth ethic and a willingness to learn. And I think you have to have, I don't want to say like a, a, like a, like a, a failing amnesia, but you have to have the ability to move forward after failing um, pretty quickly because I think, you know, everyone's going to make mistakes and you can't beat yourself up about that. And, but, and I think you'll, I think I had to learn for myself is like, you know, when, when you take risk and you take big risk and something, it doesn't go out in your favor. It's not really, it's not really like you lost, but it was really like a learning. I look at failings as learnings rather than losses. And, and so I think, I guess that in that way, it's a little bit of amnesia. I think you have to be willing to do that um, to be in the space. We call that paying tuition. Yeah. <laughs> That's your tuition. It's yes. You fail and you're like, oh no, no. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, different kind of tuition. Um, Beth, how about you? Um, yeah, tuition. Well, you know, it's, it's sort of <laughs> ironic since I'm in education. Um, yeah. you know, and I'll use that metaphor and maybe abuse it. I mean, I, I guess in my position, how I got here in a way was through being a great student. And the qualities of being a great student is all the same things we just talked about, being willing to, to learn, being willing to fail, being willing to pivot. I guess a thick skin, right? Because you have to keep going um, and you're self-directed and you are resilient and tenacious and focused. Those are the skills that I, I felt uh, as a student at Musicians Institute in the 80s, I really wanted to be there. I mean, no one was gonna give this to me. I wanted to get in there, learn everything I could, take it. No one's gonna hand it to me and that spirit uh, is what I believe propelled me into being a good teacher. And being a, a good teacher, I dare I say a pretty good teacher, um, then allowed me to continue to say yes to more opportunities and more challenges. And, you know, to become a department chair, to become an assistant dean, to become a couple of flavors of vice president, to keep saying um, the same things I said as a student. And that perspective, and I know Stacy talked about her students earlier, I feel like I'm just a big, and I've used this, to describe myself many times. I'm just an overgrown guitar student gone to seed. I'm still that same person. I never grew up. <laughs> I'm grateful I never grew up. I don't ever want to grow up. Um, and there's a sort of a, a joy in doing what I do, even when it's the hardest, you know, when my job has been incredibly difficult, incredibly challenging, when I've been stabbed in the back, when I've had stupid things mm. said in my face or, uh, you know, passed over for certain things that seemed unfair. Um, the other thing outweighs it vastly, that, that mentality, that, that, that student eye view of the world of like, isn't this a gas, man? Isn't this like the greatest thing in the world? Um, and that I felt that way, so lucky to have my, my job. I never take it for granted, I never have. Um, and even though I'm coming, you know, looking much closer at retirement than when I started now, because it's 36 years, um, you know, it's, it's just, been the greatest time. I've had the greatest time. And I think that even though all these hardships and challenges, and like, you know, we talked about being the only woman, you know, I mean, I've been a leader of, you know, groups of 50 men, even worse, 50 guitar players, you know, like I'm always the only woman. <laughs> I don't know what my, my chemistry is, but like, I'm cool. Like, that's fine. And if they say stupid shit, oh, stuff. Um, I, I don't really care, and I really don't. I mean, I don't have time for that. I don't have time right. for things that are way off, uh, you know, base here, like people's, you know, whatever their stuff is. I'm not interested. I'm interested in, I have, I have a job to do. I have things to do, and we all do. I mean, you know, all of us are incredibly prolific and busy, and I think to succeed, it's because we don't waste time. We don't waste time mm -hmm. on the things that are just, you know, like get off hmm. you know so anyway um how did I become who I am I don't know I'm just that big student honestly and that's what served me really really well you know I just love to keep on learning and that means learning how to do my job better or you know uh -huh. I have learned I will say through the decades I've learned how to be nicer and I read this this quote of Mark Cuban the guy that owns the Dallas Mavericks the basketball team um he said you know I'm like 60 whatever one he said you know I wish one thing I'd been, you know, in business is I wish I'd been nicer. Uh, I wish I'd been more kind. And and I feel like as I've gone on, I've learned to be more kind. Uh, that's been really important because when I first came out like guns blazing, like I'm going to be this kind of 
you know, intense teacher and, you know, we're really going to do this and that and I have my, whatever my agenda. Um, I think that's all been outweighed to just, you know, kindness wins. That's, that's mm-hmm. been my takeaway from my career. Kindness wins, whether it's, you know, teaching a guitar student or running something, you know, uh, sitting in a board of directors. And that's the winner to me. So uh, I guess that's my, that's my recipe. I couldn't agree with that more, Beth. And the only other thing I wanted to add to this is I I think people can see this, sense it and feel the energy of this. And, you know, when I was younger, people would say, you know, find a job doing something that you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I'm sure everyone's heard that. (laughs) Um, But it's actually true. So, you know, find the thing that you're passionate about, find the thing that feeds your soul that, you know, helps you find your purpose and and go at it and do whatever you need to do to to get there and like beth said kindness goes so far it's it's the easiest thing to do it's the easiest thing to lose at times but it's so easy to do and if you remind yourself you know it, it's it it just takes you so much further have you guys read that book so the power of nice I, I actually have it like right yeah. here on my desk. I, yes, it's I a fantastic talk about it. book. <laughs> yeah, I talk about it all the time because I think it's so. I came across that book really early in my career. I was in my twenties, I think, and somebody asked me why I was being so bitchy, <laughs> and that book was on the bestseller list at the time. And I was like, oh, maybe I need this book. And, um, <laughs> I actually read that right after The Art of Not Giving a Fuck. It was a perfect back to back. The little like sandwich. It. That's great. But I mean, I, the I thing is, you can, you, you can be yeah. kind and yeah. you, can, you can be really fierce. And yes. they don't care. Yeah, totally. Go, that, that is, that's no, they the don't. Thing. They go together. No. People don't They don't, but it, it definitely changed not just my business outlook, because I'm all about karma now. Like, I just do good things because I feel like putting good in the world is good you know yeah. um but it it just changed everything about how i approach connecting with people so i would mm. highly recommend the power of a nice really good book um i think stacy you brought up the pandemic and i wanted to just chat for a minute about um obviously it affected all of us but how has it had lasting effect on what you do in your work um i mean some some great things came out of the pandemic. Um, You know, a a reaffirmation of the importance of our work and what we're doing. Um, The ability to offer uh, remote lessons, Um, you know, something we were maybe thinking of down the road and then the pandemic happened and we're like, oh, we got to do this. So now we're able to, you know, bring music education to students who may live in areas that don't have it yet. You know, we had a student in Poland uh, reach out to us and we're like, yeah, if you speak English, you know, we can connect you or we can find someone who speaks Polish. And, you know, being able to tap into those communities that we haven't yet physically been able to reach yet. Um, The pandemic had a, a really terrible impact on mental health crisis and Mm -hmm. you know something that was already in terrible shape just just magnified and that's that's been the hardest thing to try and continue to work our way out of because we're not we're not out of it yet um you know sadly we we lost we lost an amazing student in south america you know a few months back to suicide and you know, every, every one that happens, it's one too many. And, you know, helping kids see and understand and learn that whatever it is that they're going through right now, it's temporary. You know, this is, this is not permanent and getting them the help that they need and teaching people how to see warning signs and increasing awareness and erasing the stigma of mental health. And, you know, letting people be more comfortable with saying, like, I'm not, I'm not feeling good today. Like, I'm not feeling good with me and that being okay. So, you know, the, the pandemic pulled people apart and our whole business is focused on bringing people together. So that was, 
That was really the toughest part for us was finding ways on how we can continue to bring everyone together when we were literally being forced to self-isolate. And, you know, we, we got very creative with it. We have incredible partners in the music industry and we did some amazing virtual opportunities for the kids with Jay Weinberg and Frank Zumo and the whole crew of the Pink Band and all these virtual meet and greets and Q and A's. And we did everything we could to try and bring everyone together, but it, it, it played a toll. It definitely played a toll. So as I said, you know, we, we continued to support the Society for the Prevention of Teen Suicide in any way that we can. Uh, we actually just announced our All-Stars Tour, which are the best of the best. It's less than 1% of our School of Rock students make the School of Rock All-Stars. So 62,000 students worldwide come down to 170 of the best across the world. And then we put them in seven different tour buses and they cross the U.S. and they play in all different cities and all different venues and all proceeds are going to support the Society of the Prevention of Teen Suicide. They'll be at our shows helping raise awareness. Um, please come to a show. Uh, you can find the dates on our website or you can reach out to me and I'll get you connected to where to get the tickets. But um, I think we just need, we need to continue to erase the stigma of mental health. That's that's where I have the biggest concern of, of where we're still feeling the repercussions of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Beth, how, how has it affected what happens with you and, and am I? Well, one thing before it slips my mind, Stacy, um, do you, in talking about your, your all-stars, do any of them ever get scholarships to go to music college? Yeah, so we have a, a lot of students in your school. We have a lot of students who go to Berkeley. Uh, we're based here in Massachusetts. We try and do alumni events there also, but um, not as many as we would like, but many do. And I say not as many as we like, because we want all of our students <laughs> to get scholarships <laughs> and be able to continue on their musical journey should they choose that route. Um, but Beth, you and I should definitely connect afterwards. Uh, you read my mind. Yeah, I, I, let's talk and, and maybe one way to sort of stitch together um, the conversation since this is the Women's International Music Network is I'd be interested in, in at the very least, maybe seeing if we can fund a scholarship for a female all-star for a woman uh, wow. graduate. So let's talk. Um, I, I just wanted that. to throw that out before we go back into the pandemic conversation. Absolutely. That's awesome. Cool. So let's stop. Um, I, I think probably, you know, similarly, Musicians Institute, because we're an educational, you know, uh, uh, institution and we did everything remotely. You know, of course, we had to pivot too. We had to be creative. We had to come up with ways to keep people engaged and, you know, some new technologies as well. I know that School of Rock, you know, uh, I won't name brand names, you know, that you sort of have a proprietary system of, of where you're able to do some online teaching and we've explored and worked on those kinds of things too. It's just looking for creative ways to keep people connected because that's what it's really all about. Um, you know, this this separation that Stacy um, you know, talked about keeping us all apart. You know, it, I, I sort of see culturally like the, the uh, the climate of intolerance that we're kind of living through, at least if we're talking about the United States anyway, and I think I could include other countries, but not with authority. Um, you know, I think that just sort of makes our jobs even more important, yeah. uh, even more profound, even more necessary, the work that we do in all the aspects, and not just obviously the four of us, how important are we, but all of us, anyone <laughs> that's listening to this, this call and, you know, and far beyond is that, you know, that we have a lot of catching up to do. Uh, because, uh, you know, you know, whether it is in, in the mental health sphere and, and, you know, young kids, but it's, it's the waves and waves and waves of this, we don't even know how, how far it's, it's really expanded. So I think it's something to take stock of in what we do, you know, and be aware that it isn't over and, and that it continues for us. Um, anyway, that being said, I think it's also equally important to really tell the stories of women in the industry that are histories you know, the great work of, of this organization, Laura, of your organization that we're, you know, involved with, with you and that you, you know, created is really profound and, and it's, and it's, it has stood up for telling 
these important stories and these histories. And during the pandemic, you know, they might have been a little obscured. You know, you might have to uh, dig a little further in some ways to sort of, you know, find out what's going on. So I appreciate the question, you know, for, for all of us on this call. Um, and I guess all I can sort of wrap it up with, tied up with a bow is just say it isn't over, you know? So I don't really have an answer. I, I, I think mm -hmm. on a personal level, you know, being able to work remote, for me, remote work was a gift. Like I really got a lot done <laughs> and was really, really, really effective um, and didn't mind not being on the one one freeway at all, ever. <laughs> <laughs> so it was great. <laughs> lots more, more time to That's the silver and, lining. <laughs> no, very silver, very gold, and lots more time to play my guitar, which is, is yeah. awesome. So, yeah. 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 Lindsay, do you have something to yeah. contribute? I know a lot more people picked up guitar. Here. That's true. Yeah, and I don't, like yeah, I don't, I don't have the... Uh, the the exact numbers of that, but every I want to say most of the guitar brands. When you think of the the big the big name ones, I think every guitar brand experienced kind of record sales. Um, a lot of people were home, and kind of going back to what uh, you two ladies were saying about just the need to be connected when we were forced to be apart. And I think one of those ways was be connected through music. And because of the time and, and that we live in and the advancement of technology, you're able to record something at your home, send it across the mm -hmm. country or the world and have someone else. And, and we actually did a project really, really early on in the pandemic um, in the, with a bunch of different artists on our roster and some of us uh, at Taylor. Um, there was a song that, that uh, one of our, our artists wrote and then yeah, I, there was like 50 artists on it that sung it and we sent it all wow. around the country. Zach Brown was on it. Um, Keith Goodwin from Good Old War was on it. He's the one that kind of wrote it. And we, and we, it's a song called I Know What Love Is. And all the proceeds from that song went to Music Cares because everything affected the music industry. I mean, mm -hmm. tours were shut down. Uh, production workers were, I mean, people were feeling it uh, for sure. So to see what that did, like coming together to make music and have music be the connecting factor was um, was really special because now you had all these people picking up guitar at home, players, people that maybe haven't played in a long time or maybe never thought they could learn but had time to learn. And because uh, a lot of different programs were offering virtual lessons, it was more accessible than it's probably ever been, um, along with obviously lessons on YouTube. Everything's just a little bit more accessible right now. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, this, this, this storm towards learning music and learning guitar was a really – beautiful thing in a in a dark time um i feel like the pandemic the, the the 2020 to 20 well like you guys you guys have all said this it's a it, there's a ripple effect it's still it's we don't even know the damage that that has really caused on a lot of us yet and i think people still feel it because you had the pandemic on top of all the social justice and the division the division within uh, our country and all the things that were happening so it was just a lot. And I think like for our company, yeah. So we, we've been, we've been in it from the, from guitar cells and people learning. And then we did that cool project and um, music was really kind of a, a thing to hold on to. It was the thing that kind of kept us going. Mm -hmm. And, and then on the, on the other side of things, I think as a company, we were able to say, okay, how are we um, being inclusive? How are we, how are we intentionally reaching out and making sure that uh, people from diverse backgrounds are are seen and elevated it as players on our roster and and um just making sure everybody has access to um our instruments and and if they want to play they can play so it, it was it's that's the outlier of a really dark time mm -hmm. yeah okay well i think we have time for one more question and then we're going to wrap it up um I just wanted to maybe ask you guys, so I, a lot of times people ask me, like, what advice would you give me if I wanted to enter the music industry or I've been in another career, but I love music and I would love to pivot into the music industry. Do you have any thoughts, things that you might say to somebody if they ask that question? Don't do it. No. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, you know, I mean, again, nobody's going to give you a career. If this is what you want to do, you do it. And, you know, we've talked on, uh, about and around this particular topic a few times on this call. And, and I, I think that it's, 
it's you know the cliche of passion of dedication dedication and so on and so mm -hmm. forth i mean you're going to hit bumps the music industry is famously not the friendliest place uh happiest place on earth but it is it is the happiest place on earth it's wonderful it is you know an, a, a never-ending source of um creativity and opportunity and fantastic relationships and you know adventures and journey you know it's an amazing life and there's so many ways to have it whether you're really more business oriented or you're a creator or whatever it is i mean it's very very the door is very wide you know and i pride myself on trying my best to hold it open for whoever you know passes you know behind me or you know passes me by students and you know other people if i can mentor them i really you know feel like that's a great privilege to be able to do that and keep the door open and um so I, I, I don't have specific advice other than kind of a, a summary of everything everyone said. Like, listen to this call, <laughs> you know. So I did, just kind of started out with be yourself and then later, half hour later, we're saying be yourself. And then later we said be yourself. And I think, you know, it's that, it's that cliche, like be the best you, you can be. But, but really, uh, I, I mean, um, you know, I, have a, I can say with some confidence, I think we all love what we do. We love yeah. doing it. We really do. I could feel it and see it in all of, in all of you. And um, and that's that's the only thing you need to know. If someone's talking to you about it, you know they're going to get that. You know they're gonna they're gonna get that message. You don't even have to give them a, a speech or any particular advice. Really, you know, I, I really think that uh, we are very very lucky to be where we are. And not yeah. uh, day goes by that that I take it for granted. So. Anyway, that's my advice is, you know, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> don't do it. You, um, you made a comment like the door is wide open. And that was the point I was going to make. Like, it's so, there's so many options. I mean, the four of us are in the music industry, but the four of us do completely different things in mm -hmm. different ways. And, um, you know, just, just explore all the options that are out there. Um, there's so many different ways to be in the music industry. I never thought I'd be in the music industry. I'm not a musician. I love music. I've always been passionate about music, but you know, my passion for education and enriching children's lives and my desire and my like of business in corporate America, I liked that. And it brought me to here and it's the, it's the best place for me to be. Um, so I guess my, my point is, you know, don't, don't narrow down to like, I want to be in the music industry. Like, think about what, what gives you purpose, what feeds your soul. And then think about how that can possibly connected, be connected to the music industry. I, I found my way here through, through supplemental tutoring and then preschools, you know, diaper changing. And now I'm here for almost a decade. So do do what what feeds your soul do what gives you your purpose what makes you happy and you know if that brings you into the music industry or you see that connection in it that's that's where you want to go to but i would say you know know that there are just so many different directions that you can go and you're not limited to just one path to get into the industry yeah yeah same thing as what was just said. There's so many different paths. The music industry, whether you're going as an artist, producer, manager, teaching, music manufacturer, there's so many different paths. So uh, on top of everything they said, which is probably the most important, I would say, you know, be intentional about finding a mentor in that space or mm -hmm. making relationships with people in that space, showing up, maybe finding, you know, finding ways to attend uh, relevant events or conferences in that space. Like if you want to get into the, the music manufacturing or music industry uh, instrument space, find a way to show up at NAM and meet people. And, and um, those are probably, those are probably the easiest things yeah. to do. And Laura, I think I yeah. heard you say once, like, don't say no, just say yes to everything. Yeah. Hey, do you want to come to this? Yes. Hey, do you want to take yeah. this class? Yes. Hey, just say yes to everything. And then say, yeah. to your point, network, meet people, put yourself out yeah. there. I think, like, I say this all the time, like, sh I can't tell you how many things have gone my way because I was there. Like, showing up is so powerful. 
Yeah. Like and, and even just like volunteering. Like sometimes I would go to these open mics all the time, and then I became the man, the person who ran the open mics, and then I got paid gigs from being at the open mics and I learned how to you know use all the audio gear it's like you were there you loved being there and it worked out you yeah. know I also always think about like like Beth said no one's gonna hand you a career like you still have to learn your skills like okay you decide you want to go into marketing well there's like a bazillion LinkedIn learning videos you can watch there's so many things like panels and different things Go, go to the NAMM show. And I remember one time, actually, I went to NAMM and I went into the Taylor booth and I asked, I said, who is, who runs your marketing? Because your advertising is so good. I just want to meet them. And I had a great chat with him and then we built a relationship and I'm still, you know, friendly with him after all these years. So, you know, that stuff is really powerful and people yeah. feel that passion when you're, when you're there. So. Definitely. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Before I wrap, I just want to tell you our next event is July. July, I can't even believe July is going to be here. July 20th, we're holding a live Zoom, whatever this is, StreamYard, I don't know. A streamed showcase of fantastic performances, including Laura Clapp Davidson, who works at Shore and is a fantastic performer. Um, she'll be with us. And one surprise performer that we haven't locked in yet, but coming soon. Um, and then the She Rocks Awards for 2024 is now locked in for January 25th, 2024, um, Thursday evening. And so I hope you guys save the date for that. If you can't be there in person, you can watch online. And, uh, you know, please uh, join us at thewomen.com. You can sign up for our newsletter for free. It's T-H-E-W-I-M-N.com. Um, and you can find out about all the events and great stuff that we do. Read interviews, check out our podcast, so many things. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for having us. Thank you. All right, guys. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>